Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Asset Management Webinar for Cost-Effective Solutions to Asset Management. First, a little bit of housekeeping. If you have any questions, please use the Q&A chat or Q&A section, not the chat window. We'll try and answer some of those as we go along. And then we'll finish up at the end with any remaining questions. So let's meet our speakers. Terry? Good afternoon, everybody. We're really glad that you could be here today. My name is Terry Biederman. I'm the Vice President of DLZ Michigan. Um, I've been in this space for probably, well, over th almost 35 years. Uh, was in the public sector my own self for 26 years. I was a public works director and, at a, and, and a director also at a county agency, as well as a, a township of over 70,000 70, people. Um, I've done a lot of design engineering work as well as operations. And for me, uh, asset management and those kinds of things are the fun part of things to do. It's how you manage the business and, and uh, the way that you do things. Um, you know, we can all design and build things, but operating and maintaining them and ensuring that they're gonna have the proper life cycle and effectiveness uh, over their lifespan is very, very important. Um, and so with that, I guess, um, Jen, why don't you go ahead and turn that over? I need to, yep, thank you. Got a little lag on the slides <clears throat> for whatever reason here. You should be all set. I'm clicking it. You gave me control? Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's interesting. So this is uh, just a better shot of all of this. Um, and uh, so what I wanna do at this point in time is I'd also like uh, Shannon and Laura to introduce themselves a little bit. So if you guys could go ahead. Laura? I'm Laura Groswalski, project manager with DLZ. I have over 21 years of private consulting experience, specializing in asset management, project management, stormwater systems, fog program management, and project financing. Shannon? My name is Shannon Filarecki. I've been doing this for 26, 27 years now. And I've been on both the municipal side as a public works director for a, couple, uh, for a township and a city, as well as in the private consulting side. I, like Terry, like to look at this as the fun part of managing the asset. Being a public works director, trying to figure out how to plan my capital improvement programs each year, was really difficult when I was working with paper to try and figure out what work was done, where we spent our money and how we could divvy up the projects moving forward. And then to try and justify to the public why one road got done before another road or why one water main got repaired and theirs didn't. So for me, cost-effective asset management is a critical piece in helping those that work for municipalities to move forward with their capital improvement planning. Terry? Okay, thank you. Just, uh, <clears throat> this is lagging for some reason. It's funny how it never works out when you actually practice it, right? So, <laughs> so a little bit about DLZ, everybody. Uh, DLZ is a multi-state company uh, headquartered in Columbus, Ohio. Been around for a long time. It's comprised of uh, a lot of companies over the years, but it was incorporated in 1989. We are an engineering <clears throat> news record ranked firm in multiple categories. Uh, in this case, uh, the, the top Midwest design firm is an example on here. Um, we do, or we're a full service firm, architectural and uh, civil engineering. Um, we do all kinds of specialty projects as well as tunneling and all of those kinds of things. And we do a lot of municipal, uh, a lot of municipal uh, work for our various clients as well. Here's an example of some of the clients. Uh, obviously, this is nowhere near exhaustive, but each of these are um, kind of unique in their own ways in terms of some of the things that we do for them. Uh, for instance, in the city of Detroit, we're one of the program managers for their multi, well, it'd be probably a billion dollar capital improvement uh, uh, program, as well as the Great Lakes Water Authority. Uh, we're also one of the program managers there. We're actually excited to be uh, involved in the city of Toledo right now with their um, asset, uh, their infrastructure, or I'm sorry, automated meter infrastructure program where they're replacing all of their water meters. And this is a huge step in terms of their um, asset management uh, practice and moving forward. 
Um, and some of the other communities here, uh, as you can see, we, um, we do various, uh, for the city of Flint, for example, we did a, a $2 million saw grant a few years ago where uh, we mapped all of, or actually did a whole condition assessment of their sanitary sewer system, stormwater system, mapped it, created their GIS, built a, a hydraulic water models and all of those kinds of things. And basically also created a computer maintenance management system uh, for them to manage and, and operate and maintain that moving forward. And I'm going to turn this over to Shannon and let the let the fun begin. I don't know if Shannon mentioned earlier, you guys or not. Um, please feel free to uh, uh, type in. I believe it's uh, uh, where where were they supposed to put the comments, Shannon, in, in the, the chat? Question, in the question and answer section. Okay. All right. And you know, and if any time during the presentation that you guys want to raise your hand, feel free. Uh, we like interaction and we like all those. Uh, that, you know, that's that's what makes these kind of fun. But I guess what I want to leave this with saying. This is a process, you guys. It's it's um, it's not something that happens overnight. Um, technology is one aspect of it, but the cultural organization of of your uh, of your uh, municipality uh, has got to be examined and looked at, and that's got to grow with this as well. If you don't bring the culture along with all of these technology implementations and things like that, it's 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 going to be it's going to struggle, and it's a top down process, right? Meaning that it's got to come. From the leaders of the organization, they've got to buy it. They got to believe it. They got to. They've got to support this. Um, it's 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 a process, and and I guess that's kind of where I would like to take that. Uh, at least that's the approach that I took when <clears throat> when we implemented these um these these processes. So with that, Shannon, I'm going to turn this over to you, and we'll go from there. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. So there's a driving force in today's society to get a better handle on managing the assets with which we're entrusted. Many times the capital improvement planning occurs in different departments than those who handle the daily operations and maintenance. When work orders are handed out via paper copies or assignments that are given out by phone calls, that data just isn't usually easily available to the planning and engineering staff in order to make a complete assessment of repair priorities. Many times it results in project prioritization by complaint volume. Uh, most frequent complaint goes first. It's the squeaky wheel approach to asset management. Not really the most optimum way to track and plan for capital improvements. Plus, how can you track the true cost of operating that particular piece of infrastructure? How can you complete a return on investment analysis and know when it's better to replace it than repair it? For years, the mindset has been to do more with less. As retirements and resignations have occurred, positions have remained unfilled or have been removed from the org chart altogether. Sometimes the work is contracted out to a third party to provide engineering, planning, legal, even IT support. The workload has reached a tipping point. Every department is so focused on trying to meet the requirements of their particular department that little time is available for collaboration across departments. Not only are there departmental silos, but we also have application platform islands, standalone and disconnected business automation and engineering platforms. At the top, you have the business applications, right? In the center of that is your document management system. Do you have a true document management system or does GIS use hyperlinks to get to the documents? It's a great way to start, but you can do so much more when you move to true document management. When you're using hyperlinks through GIS, every time someone in the IT group goes and realigns your server platforms or renames your drives, now all of a sudden your links are lost. And it takes time and effort to get those links reconnected. Staff get frustrated. They complain that the software doesn't work or it's too difficult to use. Sorry about that. In an effort to move towards greater operational efficiency, consistency, and accountability, utilities are spending over a billion dollars every year to incorporate technology, solutions, and processes through control, automation, workflow, modeling, and other platforms. The truth is these powerful platforms often fail to deliver full potential because they lack system integration and the necessary cultural evolution like Terry talked about a little bit ago. What if there was a way to get out of the silos? Bridge the gap between the application platforms and truly collaborate and automate processes and data analysis. 
What if you could maximize your existing investments, partner across departments and divisions, find a way to intelligently automate your capital improvements and budgeting through the use of real-time data collected from your existing systems? We've got GIS here, you've got the aerial photos, and then you've got design, which is completely separate from that work. Good news, there are solutions. There are systematic approaches to integration, utilizing diversified platforms and organizational innovation that can lead to a creation of a culture of information and personal and professional growth for all involved. Changing the organizational culture over time is the way to go. Here's just a small example. Take your GIS data with the aerial photos overlaid, merge it with your conceptual plan for a new road design. Now you have a real clear visual of what utilities are gonna be impacted by that proposed plan. Are there other utilities that may be impacted? Maybe you can start mapping out power poles, light poles, other things that may get in the way of your construction or other things that are held in your right of way. So let's start at the beginning. What's an asset? Infrastructure assets are defined as long lasting capital assets that add value to land and tend to be part of a larger system. But in reality, an asset is anything that you need to track for purchase, maintenance, repair, and replacement. It can be street signs, lights, buildings, paths, sidewalks, bridges, manholes, veils, you name it. The definition of asset management is the planning process for ensuring the optimum value is gained for each asset and that financial resources are available to rehabilitate and replace those assets when necessary. Asset management is centered on a framework of five core elements. The current state of the asset, was there a conditional analysis done? Do you know what condition it's in? The required sustainable level of service, what level of service do you need to provide your customers for that particular asset? Identification of the assets that are critical to sustained performance. Identifying the minimum life cycle costs. And the best long-term funding strategy. If you can't fund it, you can't fix it. <laughs> My favorite question is why? I also subscribe to the work smarter, not harder anthem and nothing grinds my gears more than hearing somebody say, I don't know, we've always done it that way. That tells me the person doesn't understand the full scope of what they're doing and why. How is that good for any organization? So for those of you attending this that are public works people or city engineers, I'm sure you will be able to totally identify with the following clip. As a, you guys, this is yeah. This is a real world example. This is this is pretty old. This is probably like fifteen or sixteen years old. Um, this was a video that we actually created at uh, my uh, former public works place, and I think you guys will I think relate to it. So go ahead and play that, Shannon. All right. By the way, for those of you that like it, please raise your hand when when this is over. <laughs> We almost thought we were like Hollywood or something. But how many times have you had to do this? You've been out in the field, you have a problem, and now you have to come all the way back to the office, try and figure out where your as builts are and what's in the ground. This, I mean, this is where we were. I mean, it was actually worse than this, right? It, there were plans, they were rolled up and they, they were in a furnace room in the corner. Um, this, this actually is after they were somewhat organized, right? So. I, I got to believe that a lot of you out there have experienced the same type of thing. And we, it's just kind of a fun thing to, pro, uh, to present there. So anyways, go ahead, Shannon. <laughs> so the mantra of we've always done it that way often leaves us back in the stone ages with paper copies and phone calls and no real easy data access to make truly informed decisions, we struggle. The new age is automation collaboration, coordination, and an objective, not subjective approach to complete asset management. It's what I like to refer to as soft engineering. Understanding the processes, the overlapping of responsibilities between municipal departments and other public agencies, finding ways to automate processes that are currently being handled manually, 
facilitating easy access to data to allow for informed decision-making processes rather than just following your gut or answering the loudest complaint. We have a unique structure at DLZ. In addition to your standard AE services, we also have a team dedicated to GIS, automated process interfaces, scripts, SCADA, et cetera. These things can help our clients bring together the whole package through key integration of their existing platforms. So where does it start? For us, GIS is the center of the universe. GIS sits at the core of all that we do. Most people are visual learners, right? GIS can provide the backbone of your business automation, engineering, and analysis platforms. With GIS, you're really only limited to your imagination. So what does your GIS consist of? What do you have in your GIS? Is it your standard base map files with roads, rivers, lakes, and streams, and, and maybe some utilities in there? That's great. It's a perfect starting point and it can only grow from there. How about adding things like traffic signals and lights? What about electrical conduits? You still have to go out and misdig those or stake those for construction, right? Why not put them into GIS and attach your drawings and help your field staff know what they're working with? Include your security cameras, signs, tree canopy, ADA compliance. If you're running a fog program, throw in your commercial kitchen properties, PFAS areas of concern or areas of influence, wellhead capture zones if you're using groundwater, fire rescue boundaries. You can tie this stuff in with the AutoCAD applications that fire and rescue use to run their routes for their trucks. And even more critically, your BRE scores your business risk evaluation scores for those assets that you've already analyzed. So what data have you already collected? Where is it stored? Who has access to it? Is it kept up to date? Have you done condition assessments of your pipes, water treatment plants, wastewater treatment plants, pump stations, booster stations, parks, trails, bridges, boardwalks? It can all fit in here. The sky's the limit and adding these assets to GIS isn't as costly as you might think. There are ways to get at least some conceptual assets into the system pretty easily, and it can be refined and expanded over time when it can be programmed into the budget. Laura is gonna show you some ways that we have harnessed existing GIS data for many of our clients to move towards that intelligent asset management process. But first, let's see if we have any questions. Tiffany, do we have any questions yet? We don't have any questions in the queue yet, Shannon. All right, wonderful. Laura, I will turn it over to you. Okay. The Michigan Department of Environment, Great Lakes and Energy offered grants to communities to develop asset management plans for sanitary and storm sewer systems. Money was available for condition assessments of pipes that were at least 20 years old. Cleaning and televising is a critical piece of data collection when trying to evaluate the condition of underground piping. Failure of an underground utility can result in catastrophic failures above ground that can cost communities millions of dollars on emergency repairs. If you regularly clean and televise your sanitary or storm sewer network, do you go the extra step to make sure that each segment is rated using the PACP NASCO standards? What about your manholes? Are those MACP rated? This graphic here identifies the PACP rated sanitary sewer segments throughout the community in GIS, with one being good condition and five being poor. There we go. Sorry about that. So this slide here um, is an illustration of the previous slide, which basically just shows the uh, sanitary sewer segments that have been, again, been integrated into GIS with the um, conditions. And we put together a capital improvement plan identifying um, the, the proposed sanitary sewer lines um, throughout the 20 year period.
the um, we worked on uh, drinking water asset management grants for communities and throughout the state of Michigan for their lead and copper rule. And so we integrated uh, tap cards into the GIS and additional records into the GIS. And so this map shows the, in the green segments here, these are the um, in-home inspections that we plan to do through that program. This uh, graphic here shows the um, safety path assessment program that we did for a community. And this is a, great tool to identify as going through the assessment to um, community staff can click on each uh, segment here and can identify different, uh, you can pull up uh, photographs and reports and different data on the various assessments as assets within your community. You can see here on the left-hand side, um, we have assessed 94% of the safety paths within the community. And the nice thing is you can look at uh, bridges and you can look at the various um, uh, trail smug segments and that kind of thing all within the, um, the GIS. The, the nice thing with that is running your dashboards while you're out doing the field work, that dashboard is continually updated. So as new deficiencies are identified, people back in the office can see how the inspection process is proceeding and can even have access to the data that's been collected in the field right away. This image is an example of how PACP and ACP TT can, CCTV can be incorporated into GIS. The purple pink lines here are sanitary sewer segments. And by clicking on each segment, you can view the CCTV video for easy retrieval and capital improvement planning. Well, um, one thing to add on that, everybody, it's, a, it's important to know, we, we created this application um, integrating the PACP data the, and the CCTV video data <clears throat> directly into the geo database, meaning that you don't have to go out and have another um, application or a, some third party application to view this. All the scoring information is in here directly in GIS. Um, cost information is as well uh, for a couple of applications for the communities that wanted it. One of them was Genesee County. But anyways, they can go through there and um, with that information in there, they can, uh, they can actually, we, we created a reporting tool for them to also be able to summarize and create PDFs for uh, project planning and, and actually to take the city council for uh, project budgets and those kinds of things. So again, everything is in the geo database. It's not hanging out there in a filing cabinet you know, how many of you have experienced where, how much do you spend each year to CCTV or sewer system in the uh, firm that does it for you? <clears throat> they bring it in and it's on a hard drive or whatever, and it goes to the shelf and nobody ever looks at it again. Here we've integrated it directly into the GIS and anybody with access to GIS can see that. Go ahead, Laura. I'm trying. There we go. <laughs> Scanned as-built drawings, inspection reports, and photos can be attached to the asset in GIS for easy access instead of having to refer to old paper records. Fat soils and grease or fog is an increasing problem throughout the country. Fog can accumulate in sanitary sewers and create sewer backups in homes and businesses sanitary sewer overflows, and sewer collapses. Fog management is critical to minimize O&M costs, resources, and fog in the system. We have worked with several communities to adopt a fog management program that consists of ordinance development, inspections, work order development, and enforcement. The image at the top is a fog work order system where inspection reports, photos, maintenance, and enforcement records can be easily accessed. The image at the bottom shows the fog property layers in pink, which is tied to the GIS and the work order system. PFAS, which stands for per and for polyfluoroalkyl substances, say that five times fast, <laughs> are a group of man-made chemicals that have a variety of uses in the food and manufacturing industries. PFAS is considered an emerging contaminant, is heavily prevalent, and can lead to adverse human health effects. We are currently working on a PFAS mitigation project for a client that has identified PFAS in a community drinking well. 
we are locating to isolate, excuse me, we are looking to isolate the source of PFAS, conduct private well testing for presence of PFAS, and determine if an existing public water main needs to be extended to these residents with private wells. Moving forward, all of our data and information will be integrated into GIS. Municipal cemeteries are often un 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 underfunded. Burial rates and maintenance fees are typically not sufficient to cover the operations and maintenance costs of aging and historic cemeteries. Safeguarding important paper records and insufficient or inaccurate records and maps are also an ongoing problem for cemetery managers. In addition, genealogy searches from residents and loved ones are becoming increasingly popular. We have been working with communities on cemetery management approaches to transfer paper records to GIS, survey the entire cemetery, thus creating efficiency and security. So the picture here is just an illustration of what we can do for communities. The color designations identify available plots per lot. So this information can be integrated into the GIS. All your paper documentation can be integrated into a format that's easily accessible. QGIS or free GIS is a software option for smaller communities that may not be so tech savvy or have the resources to manage an ArcGIS system. This is an example here of a staff portal that we uh, are working on with a community. So it provides cemetery block information and community staff can identify who was buried within the block, where, where they were buried and so forth. This is an individual burial search that was incorporated on a community's website. This allows the general public to perform a drill down search of those that are buried at the cemetery. We worked with the community to integrate all paper documentation into GIS and perform survey of the cemetery to help generate the genealogy search. So you can see here on the left-hand side, this you can just type in the name and this will give you the location of the people that are buried within that plot. So again, this is a way to streamline your activities, right? In the past, if this was all paper copies, somebody would have to come in, go through the records or submit a FOIA request to try and gather the information. Now you've put it at their fingertips, they can go out and search for it and you've freed up your staff people to do other work that, that the municipality needs them to do. In addition to that, I just wanna add that this is also in several communities been linked to the um, computer maintenance management system as well to keep track of labor equipment and material that it takes to, you know, to maintain the, uh, the various uh, plots and, and things like that. So again, you got the GIS part of it and then you've got it linked to computer maintenance management where we talk about and what we've been saying all along is leveraging these applications where GIS is the core of this and you're building these other applications that leverage that. We do have four questions that we could go over those now before I turn it over back to Shannon. Can I read those off? Yeah, that'd be wonderful. Okay. Uh, there's a question. Do you think that GIS is best suited for static information? What is what is its size, age, or also variable information conditions? If the latter, how often would you recommend updating condition assessments since they change over time? So I think static information is probably the best place for GIS. And then the information that changes over time would be something that you could handle through your computerized maintenance management systems. But there are ways that you can do it within GIS too. Terry, you want to add anything more to that? Well, I think one of the ways that it gets updated over time is that you, you've built a capital improvement plan, right? And as you implement that capital improvement plan, you're going to update GIS. So for instance, if you replace a water main or rehabilitate a water main, or a sanitary sewer main, you're going to update that status in GIS. And then what you do so that you can maintain the history is that you retire that previous asset as, uh, as past um, so that you can, you know, if you want to go back in time and take a look at it, you can absolutely do that. So that, that's kind of the way that you would handle the static information versus real-time information. So what you got to remember is that this becomes the business process. And, and I can't overstress this, meaning that 
everybody is using GIS and, and everybody's going out and using like computer maintenance management. So is your staff are out in the field using this every day, they should be collecting information. So for instance, let's say that they were out and they were, they were going to um, flush a fire hydrant. They went out and in GIS, the fire hydrant was shown in the wrong corner of the street, for instance. Um, they should be marking that up with their, their tablet or their mobile device. And that should be getting submitted to the uh, GIS IT department for them to update. So this becomes a living, breathing, a continually updated application. Next question. Does GIS accept AutoCAD format? Yeah, yeah, you can always export from AutoCAD into GIS. I mean, it, it's, it's, it, it's, you know, you've, uh, I, I'd have to get the CAD people in here for that. I've never <laughs> personally done that, but yes, there are export capabilities that allow for that to happen because a lot of times communities, what they want, they want when they um, have plans come in, the planning staff will get those files in CAD and then those CAD files are converted and put into GIS in the future. And we do that with a lot of our municipalities. So when, when as-builts come in, the as-built drawings get reviewed and approved in a, a paper copy first, but once they're approvable, they get stamped approved, and then the electronic file gets submitted. There's an electronic stamp that gets placed on those, and then that goes to the GIS department so that they can incorporate that new GIS or that new utility layout or road layout into GIS. So now you have an updated GIS layer that shows the addition of a new development or a water main replacement or um, sidewalk gap closures. Next question, if you're loading data with different formats, how can GIS handle scaling of different map formats? Well, and that you, you're kind of talking about a couple of, so a map format, I guess it would depend on what map format you're talking about. For instance, are you talking about, you know, um, uh, the more like the a North American datum type format, or are you talking about a, like a CAD paper map that needs to be rubber sheeted in? The, I guess the bottom line is, is that it would depend on what type of map or whatever format that you were looking to incorporate into GIS, but it's, it's pretty flexible. And I don't think I've seen too many that, uh, uh, haven't been able to been incorporated have have been able to be incorporated uh, that haven't been able to be incorporated. I guess is what yeah, I'm trying with, to say. Right with with AutoCAD drawings, if it's a scanned PDF of the file rather than an AutoCAD file, you can find your scales and adjust them. You know, we use Bluebeam a lot here, but there's there's other applications and ways that you can check the scale on the drawing or overlay it with the aerial image to try and get things to align. There's, there's lots of different ways to adjust the scales to make sure that things fit into the GIS system. Is the work order management a separate software or is it part of the GIS system? So, so typically the work order management system is separate uh, and it then you have your connectors between the work order management system. It, it sits typically on top of your GIS. They, they do have them that are separate. Our preference is to work with those that sit on top of GIS. They use your base GIS data, and then they whatever assets you have defined in GIS, you can assign work orders to through that separate work order management system. So this is really a GIS centric approach, and this is this is another very important part. Is that that's to, to us the geo the geo database, the GIS database is the center of the universe, and and that's really the single version of the truth for you guys. Meaning that um, when you when you build the GIS and you connect it, so app, uh, city work or like CityWorks is a good example, I guess, of a CMMS applications GIS centric. One of the original founding uh, companies that went along with that principle. A lot of a lot of companies are out there now, and and, and they they are more seamlessly integrated with the um, with the geo database. But uh, that's kind of where we are. Is that you're not having to maintain a separate database for a computer maintenance management system, and then have those two linked together to talk to the GIS and and, and move that data back and forth. What we're, we're we advocate at least, and and for most cases, is the single geo database that. The, the, uh, the computer maintenance management system that would uh, hook to and run off of, but it would, it would be the same. Uh, they're, they're basically seamless to the user at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. 
Next question, have you run into any server storage issues when integrating the sewer videos into the GIS? We currently utilize a third-party software to televise and inspect our sewers. And unfortunately, we can only store one to two inspection videos per segment. Yeah, well, uh, without knowing all of the details, and, and if you want to uh, dig into that deeper, I would encourage you to reach out to us and talk to us about it. But Definitely. that's a question really a lot of the past, right? Today, storage is very, very cheap. Um, and and so uh, in most most places have got very robust server capability. And if you if you don't have it internally, there's always the uh, option of going cloud based in terms okay. of the uh, Amazon Web Services or whatever. But um, I would say that Without knowing all the details in that question, um, I, you shouldn't, uh, with today's technology, have really limiting factors in terms of CCTV being integrated. And I think that kind of goes along with the next question. When we talk about the example community, um, how much network storage would they have to have for the sewer videos linked into the GIS? And I think most of the communities we're working with nowadays are pretty much running cloud-based, right, Terry? No, actually, a lot of them are. Well, it gets, so it's really a demarcation in a lot of cases of the, what the community's sophistication is, right? A lot of them have IT departments and, and they've got their own server farms and those kinds of things. But there are a lot of communities out there that don't have the uh, technical expertise or whatever to do that. And so they elect to, to go to um, Amazon Web or you know, um, IBM and those kinds of places. So there's a similar question, the last one for now. For the example community you showed, how much network storage do they have for the sewer videos linked into the GIS? So the, uh, I guess I don't remember which one that was. Um, uh, I can tell you that for the community, Genesee County, I believe it's maybe in the two terabyte range. Okay, with that, I guess we can turn it back over to Shannon. Okay, so how do you move towards the intelligent asset management and what are the benefits? Benefits include optimized oper operations, reduced energy costs, reduced chemical costs, equipment and labor costs, increased project justification, service life optimization, integrated data for better capital improvement planning, timely and accurate responses to operational and process problems, effective customer service, greater value engineering, and increased system resilience, increased system resilience to malevolent attacks. Up-to-date GIS systems, computerized maintenance management software, all linked to a true document management system, puts tools in the hands of your field staff where they need them, in the field. You can optimize your staff resources, minimize the need for paper records. Remember that yield map video? There's the big giant book that he has to open up. Somebody has to reprint those sheets every time that there's an update. If you're doing it in GIS and you're updating your GIS as you make the capital improvements, the updates are done systematically as part of your process. It attaches all of the pertinent data to the asset, decreases the response time, it puts the data in the hands of the operators right out in the field. So there's no running back to ye old map room to try and figure out where everything's located. Wouldn't it be great for your MISDIG or 811 utility stakers to be able to see the record drawings and the tap cards for you, your utilities so that they can do a double check when they're flagging the locations in the field? What if they could generate a work order that would be sent to the GIS person or your consultant to update the base GIS data when they find something in the field that doesn't match what's shown on GIS? This is what Terry was talking about earlier in making it part of the business process. All of these are linked. And now as part of the day-to-day -day process, when somebody's out in the field and they see that the GIS isn't necessarily representing what they're seeing in the field, they can send that back to a work order and get it in the queue to get it updated. So now you've got a living, breathing document in your GIS. It's not just this static piece of information that goes out of date in five years. One of, 
one other thing I want to, sorry, Laura, if you go back to that, one other thing I want to add to this is that, again, talking about applications that can be built on this even more, right? So there are automation applications. One of them happens to be called DigSmart, which um, I implemented that probably 20 years ago. But anyways, what that does is it literally takes the uh, missed dig ticket information, it parses it into a database, and then it geocodes the staking request in your GIS and with a, with a, uh, a bubble or whatever around whatever parameter you set for the diameter of that uh, that staking request, and you can move it around if you want to after that. But but really, the bottom line is is that um, staff can actually process staking tickets in seconds, as opposed to you know minutes or even longer, <clears throat> having to go to filing cabinets to figure out whether or not they've got utilities there to stake or not. It's a very it's a very again it's another application. It's leveraging. The GIS, that that big investment into GIS, and that's what it's all about, right? It's it's building these applications to leverage that GIS investment. Thank you, Terry. So, reducing the manual activities with automated processes, reducing your paper records with electronic ones, it frees up space, gives you some real estate back, but most importantly, it provides access to the data that your staff needs at their fingertips no matter where they have to work, whether it's in the field or from home, as we've experienced going through this, this pandemic. Oftentimes we've had to have staff working from home. It's difficult to try and get the information you need if all the records are kept in a paper copy back in the office. One of the things I wanna to add to this picture before Laura moves on in the upper right-hand corner, what this is, is actually a 3D representation of a sanitary sewer system. So what we, what we did here again is uh, using GIS and uh, a sewer hydraulic model uh, as we projected the hydraulic grade line rising from, you know, uh, say a pump station a manhole surcharging or the uh, inlet coming in to its surcharging, we could theoretically map out um, properties that would be impacted by uh, basement backups or uh, sanitary sewer overflows. And again, it's leveraging that GIS data and then incorporating that into a hydraulic model that allows us then to tie it into um, real-time operations as a wet well level begins to rise, we can begin to see when we're hitting critical elevations. I know that a lot of operators intuitively know that sometimes, right? Um, however, those people are retiring. And then a lot of times, I think a lot of you out there will know that at least in my personal experience that they weren't always quite accurate. <laughs> Well, and, and to take that one step further, this is part of your cultural change, right? You may not have the data now, but you can collect it moving forward. What if your process is set up such that every time somebody has to go into a home, the work order requires mandatory pieces of information, pictures of the water meter, identification of the material type upstream and downstream of the water, lead and copper control rules, are requiring us to identify the service leads and the types of materials in the house so you can do your lead sampling, right? If you set up your process so that if you're gonna do an entry into a home, not only are you picking up key pieces of information that you need for your water meter, but also collecting any basement information that you have, now that information can be incorporated into your GIS and it can become more and more robust so that you can do things like Terry just explained, modeling your water or sewer systems and identifying when a backup may occur or who might end up having to have a boil water notice if you have a, a water main break. The picture to the right is kind of a little more information on mapping and assessments of your manholes. You can do 3D assessments of your manholes and then those images are captured in a series of photographic images that can be tied to that asset in your computerized maintenance management software. And now you can see the condition and see where the problems are in your manhole. Use that data to generate your RFPs or your capital improvement plan for doing the maintenance and operation. Benefits of control and auto automation. Integrating your SCADA with automation. Analyze and react quicker to operational changes. Make better planning decisions. Automate work orders based on pump run times or alarms that are triggered in SCADA. Operators can set up personalized views and IT can still have that control to limit users to view only their areas of responsibility so that you don't have people playing in other ponds, I guess, for, for lack of a better term. 
Remember Laura's example from earlier, identifying the sewer projects based on condition assessments and setting the proposed year for replacement? What if you were to overlay those water and sewer condition assessments with the PASER ratings for your roads and include the road types so you know what funding mechanism is available to pay for that particular repair? Now you can start to prioritize these projects. You can justify to the residents why one road gets repaved before another one. It can help the elected officials see a truly objective approach to asset management. It takes the emotions right out of the equation. You aren't just limited to linear assets either. Buildings and fleet can be added to your GIS just as easily. It can be as simple as a single polygon for an entire parcel, like a fire station or a lift station. All work orders can be tracked against that individual polygon. Now you can get an understanding of the cost of operating that individual facility. If you wanna know the cost of managing all your boilers across all of the facilities that you own, well, refine the GIS layer, allow work orders to be written against that specific asset. For example, if the plans of your facilities are scanned in, the layout in the rooms can be geospatially located in GIS. This here is an example of a town hall where we did that with their asset or their, their township hall and their other buildings. Individual rooms can have their own polygon in GIS. Work orders can be written against that particular space. If you need to do a contract out for carpet, new carpet or flooring, you can easily get square footages, export the data out, run it in a report, create your RFP without having to send somebody out to take manual measurements that they send back to you either in an email or a piece of scrap paper that can get lost. So one other thing on this as well, you guys, is, is again, from the computer maintenance management side of the world, as it, I like to call it having, creating virtual, virtual um, operators uh, in the sense that um, you can use computer maintenance management to schedule routine activities. For instance, on a building, it could be HVAC inspection, it could be belt replacement, it could be carbon monoxide uh, detector replacement. It could be whatever you um, have to schedule for regular routine maintenance. Uh, once a year, uh, every fall, it's a uh, evaluation of the, you know, the heating and, and uh, HVAC system. So all of that can be scheduled to, to, so you don't have to remember to do that. Those work orders will pop up automatically. And same thing with the grounds. Um, you can literally, these grounds have been digitized in too. So they could literally click on uh, those roads or those uh, green spaces, and they can write work orders uh, to actually mow the lawn or remove a bee's nest or whatever is in there, um, as well as schedule uh, so that a work order pops up each week at the same time, telling them that this lawn needs to be mowed or these flowers need to be trimmed or whatever. So it's really what your business process is, but if you get it into GIS and you get it a polygon and it knows what it is and it's smart, you can, you can incorporate that into a computer maintenance management system to uh, create not only work orders to do things, to track labor, equipment, and material, but to also schedule work as well. Well, and take it one step further. Link it to your financial software so that your purchase orders are tracked, your construction pay requests are logged in, and all of the requirements at the end of the project, the, all the requirements for an audit at the end of the project are already uploaded and attached to the asset as work progresses. Now your treasury department or your finance department are as up to date as, as your engineering or operations and maintenance department. Add in the AVL application, your automatic vehicle locations, and now you can track the hours of engine runtime, revolutions on tires, trouble code, codes recorded by the vehicle's computer systems, automate the work orders to change the oil after so many miles or rotate the tires after so many revolutions, or require a piece of equipment to come back to the shop for some diagnostic work to see what's causing the error codes. You can get that vehicle or that piece of construction equipment out of service before it becomes a danger to the operator. Once the data is stored in the system, you can mine that data out and put it in a wide variety of charts and reports. Here you can see the facilities and operations annual buildings and ground work orders. How many work orders were held each year? If you wanted to look more at the financial end of your capital improvement projects, 
you can mine the data. The limit is just your imagination. What do you need? If the data is in there, you can mine it out and you can put it into a nice crystal report and give it to those that need to make the decisions on funding. But I guess the key point, and Terry started with this at the beginning, is that without updating and changing the culture of the organization, most of these technology initiatives are going to fail. At best, they remain a standalone application used by specific groups without the benefit of integration, resulting in the lost opportunity of leveraging that technology investment. Organizational initiatives need to be part of any implementation plan. Don't computerize a bad business process. Take the time to look at what you're doing and why you're doing it, and if it still makes sense to do it that way. If not, take the opportunity to fix it now. Define your organizational needs and goals. Align positions and classifications with the mission needs and objectives. Standardize on core computer hardware and software platforms. Create a culture of personal and professional growth. Disseminate the programs and the organizational information to governing bodies and the public regularly. And implement it incrementally, building on progress, progress made from <laughs> previous work. You try and do it all at once, and it's going to be a recipe for disaster. Start small and build into it. As everybody gets comfortable, you can add new phases as they start using it on a regular basis. And they say, you know, it'd be really nice if I could do this. Now you can expand it because you know they're using it and they're starting to gain the attraction and, and seeing the value in the products that you've already purchased. Consider flattening the organizational structure. Flatter organizational structures enable greater levels of communication between staff and management, uh, empowering your staff to take charge, aid in the decision-making, work towards common goals, and hold accountability for the utility's success. Decisions and responses can be made faster by not having to move up the chain of command for permission and direction, and eliminate the not in my sandbox mentality through cross-training initiatives. It's important for the staff in various departments to know how the things that they do interact with other departments so that we can start to foster that teamwork approach rather than this is what I do and this is what he does. I don't know how my stuff fits his or he doesn't know how his stuff fits mine and that's okay. That kind of breaks that culture of productivity. And that's the thing that we're trying to get away from when we talk about truly um, asset management from um, a growth perspective. Add public outreach and service. Leverage the technology and investments that you have to provide more efficient, consistent, and accountable information and about services to your public. Accomplish this through your public education, your online services, Detailed operational reports with data mined from your CMMS system or your financial engineering and, and analysis. The automation of that application platform investment can, can be critical in this. Finally, public aware or summary. Um, return on investment. Data for project justification is there and it's at your fingertips. Integrated data equals better operational and capital infrastructure planning. Maximized use of the application expenditures throughout or through the integration with other departments. If you're using computerized maintenance management software for your underground utilities, why not make that available to your facilities people too? You already have it there. The base is already started. Now you just have to get a couple extra licenses and set up the work orders that they need for the facilities piece versus the underground piece. Integrate your hydraulic water and sewer modeling systems to do deficiency analysis. It gives you a greater value engineering and optimization of your project scheduling. And then finally, public awareness. Being proactive in your customer service response and accountability, giving public empowerment and awareness through their customer service portals so they can see billing and other operational and information programs enhanced public utility re relationships. It doesn't just have to be posting a report to your website. You can create GIS maps of your proposed construction projects, 
publish those to the website. Let your customers and residents see what work is taking place in the community and give them a rough idea of when that work is going to start and end. Support information to your public explaining the project and its prioritization. Those can all be linked to the project if people want more information, they can drill down through that through your portals. So basically in summary, the limit only exists in the mind. If you think it, you can do it. We just have to set up the baseline first. Any questions? I guess we'll open it up to questions now. Terry, Laura, you guys have any other comments you'd like to add? No, other than that, this just scratches the surface, you guys. And we wanted to make this practical um, presentation. We didn't get into the uh, the old academia business risk evaluations. We, you know, I think everybody's familiar with that. It's all part of this. And we did talk about it a little bit, but we really wanted to focus on um, showing real world applications for this and that it, it does exist out there and it can be successful. There was one question I, I answered it while Shannon was talking. Um, we are recording this webinar, so we are going to pass that along to the participants following this, this session. And we did, like, we, we did just have another question come in. Yep. It says, when comparing the road soft data to sewer condition and water main size and age to find candidate projects, is that comparison done by visually reviewing the maps or is there further steps that can be taken with the ARC tools or joins? So that's, that's the issue we have here in Michigan, right? Road soft is typically where all of your road agencies store their capital improvement planning for roads. And then you usually have some other software that you're utilizing for your computerized maintenance management systems. You can get exports out of road soft bring those into GIS so that you have your PASER data in the exact same place as your water and your sewer conditions. By then you can use the mapping feature in GIS to color code the different, your, your PASER ratings versus your water main or sewer main sizes or BRE scores so that you can keep it all in one place. This is part of the integration discussion, right? It's not just having all of these separate pieces of software that we use and not having them talk to each other. It's writing those automated process interfaces to take the data from RoadSoft, all the projects that you've identified, the cost associated with those projects, linking it to your water and sewer data for your BRE scores, and then putting it together as one big package. That's part of that data mining option, right? I, I hope that answered your question. Uh, that's just it. In fact, we're doing that for, um, we're actually doing that for the city of Pontiac. We are taking their um, their uh, road soft information and their PACP information and everything like that. And we're, we're going to export the road soft information. We've already, we've already mapped their road system in the city and, and we'll be able to uh, incorporate the PASER information from road soft into that so that that'll help expedite um, and get that PASER data into, um, into the GIS quicker. Well, I don't see any other questions. So at this, we will let you guys get back to your day. We thank you for joining us. And if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to Terry, myself, or Laura. Thank you. Have a nice afternoon. Bye -bye.